Hey there everyone, my name is Jordan from Happen Films and this is Limestone Permaculture Farm. Well, I'm Brett Cooper and um, I'm m myself, my wife Nicole Cooper are the owners of Limestone Permaculture. It's a little farm based up in the Stroud Valley. I wanted to start a permaculture farm based on the fact that about 12 years ago my wife had gone through a, a bit of an illness where she had to change the way she ate. We were living in Newcastle at the time and we decided to change the way we were living in the way of food production. You know, instead of going down and buying all our supposedly fresh produce <laughs> from um, our local grocers and suppliers, we started growing it ourselves. Brett and Nikki grew their knowledge about organic gardening by reading books, watching documentaries and working on their tiny 330 square metre property in Newcastle. They created a successful intensive veggie garden, which led to holding open days, developing community gardens, being featured in the local newspaper and sharing food with neighbours. Brett then completed a permaculture design certificate with Peter Brecknock from Allen River Permaculture. Basically by this stage we were looking to uh, move out of Newcastle, we were looking to get a little property. We spent 18 months looking for the right place and uh, eventually we, we settled on this uh, Stroud Road. So this is our, our little swale set up here. It's, uh, it's made up of four main swales and a little mini swale further north. In the top two, we've got that set up with a lot of subtropicals. And as it ventures down further down the slope, we've got uh, espaliered um, apple and pears. The swale system now is really looking after itself. We just come through and essentially just do a little bit of a chop and drop. It's self-seeding a fair bit now. Um, we, during the early years, we, we ran pumpkins and squash uh, in here, along with sweet potato and nasturtiums to get that ground cover. The pumpkins and the squash are prolific down here. We had a great crop last year. And because we left some of the uh, pumpkins to rot, there's a few, quite a few pumpkins in here as well, we'll get self-seeding in pumpkins. There's quite a bit of comfrey too. That makes for really good chop and drop because it bulks right out and we just come through about midsummer and just drop it and spread it back out. And then it shoots up again. You get the same amount by the end of summer. Essentially our soil isn't that great and when we cut in for the, uh, the swales, the spoil is obviously not the best at all. So it, there's been, we've been putting quite a bit of emphasis on trying to re rebuild the soil content in that, in that spoil that's on the backside of the swale. The swales are working for themselves now. We don't have to seed anything anymore. All we really do now is just maintain. It's a beautiful thing. I'm only here afternoons and weekends and I have to work five days a week. I'm like most people, I've got a standard job and yet we make this happen and we make this work. You know, I'm more than confident to say that if it's possible for me, it's possible for anybody. We have a farm gate out the front and we supply um, veggie boxes to, um, to cafes and to other markets. Um, I would only suggest that at the moment we're easily feeding 50 families um, and I'm just one person. We're producing a fair amount coming out through our little farm gate out the front. Currently, seasonally, we've got brassicas, got all your, all your variety of herbs. We have potatoes, sweet potato, lemons and oranges, mandarins. Yeah, so this is, um, this is Bernie the caravan. He came from Bernie Butler's place, who was a local farmer not far from here. This caravan was picked up off his farm. It was completely covered in moss and, you know, it looked like it had been under a tree for 30 or 40 years, which it probably has. With the farm gate, there's actually two farms involved. Cottage Barn B&B, which is in Stroud, a little farm run by uh, Ken and Carol Maddox. And Ken is the other part of Two Men and a Pumpkin. So we've got two farms supplying our little farm gate. We basically have our veg displayed here and over on the other little part of the farm gate. I love seeing people's faces when they when, you know, they see beautiful big tomatoes and beautiful big eggplants and you know, they're, they're absolutely excited to know that they're going home to cook with something. The place itself has, um, has allowed me to expand my permaculture research. It's allowed me to um, be a little bit innovative with the permaculture. It's allowed me to, um, you know, trial and error. And we've had some errors, no doubt, but we've had some successes. This is what I like to call a hybrid shade house. So it hasn't really got a, a proper name, but it's essentially old Perspex sides, which is designed to buffer the wind, try and trap a little bit of heat. And then you've got the mesh on top, which allows the rain to come through, but without any sort of frost or hail. It allows the air to get in, but without too much of the wind through there as well. Um, so essentially it's, a, it's not a hot house and it's not really a shade house, it's a bit of both. It's set up as an exclusion zone, so it's another area where we like to put crops in that are heavily affected by things like cabbage moth, you know, other flying bugs. In here at the moment, this is just finishing off the winter plants. This is all different varieties of brassica. 
It's quite intensively stacked. So yeah, it works from, from low up to high. Um, that's to try and capture the, the midday and afternoon sunlight. Um, so at any one stage uh, during the day, the, these plants are getting sun in some form or fashion. We've only had this in place for about two years. And what we did find was when we had the tomatoes and capsicums in here last, last summer season, we had a bit of problem with fungi and a type of mold that was getting on them. And we found that was due to the fact that it wasn't getting enough airflow. Um, so once we had the tomatoes moved into a location where they got more airflow, they actually thrive quite well. Um, so what we're doing here now is we're actually trying to think of a way where we can maybe put shutters on these perspex panels and on the door so we can actually get some low airflow going through in summer but close them off for winter. So that would be the next stage where we're looking at now to try and rectify that matter. And that came back from observation and then looking for a solution. It's been interesting. The, the trapped airflow doesn't affect the brassicas at all. It was only the more summer plants that obviously the high temperatures, um, the high humidity. So that was really interesting. Um, and that's just another good example of observation. The principles behind permaculture are natural. That's the key element. And you can work with nature, you don't have to fight it. It's not that hard. When we first got here, there was no fencing here whatsoever. This was just all open paddock, apart from the front fence. When we first got here, we put a basic fence up. We put our Dorper sheep in there, and that's why we've got the barriers around the fruit trees. And basically what we tried to do was, was two things. One, we needed an area to put the sheep just while we got other things set up. And two was we wanted to try and rejuvenate what little soil was in this area. Once we got the other little paddock set up, we moved those sheep down to the other paddock and we brought the ducks in here. So we had our Muscovy ducks here for another 12 months. We then opened it up and brought the chooks in and, and integrated the uh, chook pen, um, which we've got in here, which is an enclosure. That's something that is completely enclosed to protect them from foxes. Um, if we don't do that, we've already lost umpteen dozen chooks in the early days from, from foxes jumping over the fences. Uh, this guarantees they're safe at night, and then we open them out, let them out in the day, and then in the afternoon they go back in and we shut them back in again. The barriers are still left in place uh, with the chooks because, as you can see, um, a chook is just coming out, and what they do is they jump inside, they go through, pick up the worms, the grubs, they, what little bit of grass might be growing in around there, they tear that up. Um, the good thing is, is when they're digging and turning that soil, it hits the tin and bounces back in. So it actually, we don't lose any soil content. And they do their little bits of manure and whatnot. So they continually turn that soil around these fruit trees, which uh, the trees love. At the moment, we run four different breeds of chicken. So we've got the Barnavelders, Plymouth Rock, the noisy rooster Plymouth Rock at the moment. And we've got something very similar to an Isa Brown, but it's called a Highline. We picked them up when they were young, so they haven't had their beaks nipped or anything like that. So they're living a pretty good life. And we've also got Australorps. So they're all good egg production. And we've got a couple of uh, dual purpose birds in there as well. Uh, the Kaku Campbells are purely for eggs. They make the best duck eggs in the world. Um, that's my opinion. We have um, a couple of little exclusion areas for our ducks. Um, when they have their young, we keep them inside this, uh, this, netted, uh, this meshed enclosure um, because we have problems with uh, local eagles, hawks, crows, and quolls, um, and uh, all of which can easily take the babies away um, before you even know what's going on. By setting them up like this for about a three week period, it ensures the rate of survival is, is quite high. Um, you still get the odd one that might die just out of natural causes, but essentially um, we're normally up around that 90% when they're inside the cage. So after the three week period, we then, move, we then open up the cage door and allow the rest of the flock um, to come through. And, and, and they intermix and, and associate themselves with the babies and within a couple of days, um, they're all out into the paddock and, and, and they're happy as Larry. But it's really important to protect them in those early few weeks, otherwise you've got a good chance of losing them to, uh, to some predators. Brett and Nikki are able to cover the input costs for the farm by selling produce, doing design and consultancy work and running workshops. So for me, perm permaculture is, is not just gardening, it's not, it's not just organics, it's, it's not just, um, you know, pa passive living, it's, it's the whole package. There is a better way to live. You don't have to move to, the, to a rural area, you don't have to um, be moved, you don't even have to leave your apartment. It's just the footprint you leave, it's just the things, it's the little things you do and what you do. It's, it, it's about 
trying to be sustainable on, on all the little components where you possibly can. If you can supply yourself with a few herbs and veggies, fine. If you can reduce the amount of time that you, you need to drive a vehicle, fine. You know, just look at all the little things you can do. Um, all that's got to help. The sheer fact that you're trying to reduce your footprint on this planet means that you will make a difference. We've got a series of swales, but in front of the swales, we've got a standard no, um, no dig raised bed that uh, captures some olive trees and some um, cherry trees and whatnot through there, pomegranate. The garden bed just below is a little bit of a hugel culture experiment. It's just a type of no dig bed that minimizes the amount of soil you need to use. We got there and we filled it up with um, six, eight and 10 inch size logs in the, in the lower levels. Uh, we used um, banana trunks and smaller trunk trees in through the, uh, the, the secondary layer. Then we started using the, the, the two, three inch branches from those other trees in that next layer above that. Then we started getting into the, um, the twigs and the finer branches on top. Then it was finished off with a uh, mixture of um, compost and um, hay, some hay bales and mix it. And then we just lined it out with a few troughs of um, soil, which enabled us to get our basic veggie plantings off and running. It's dropped a fair weight. You can see that it's gone down about probably near 300 millimetres. It used to be over the top. So those logs and the, the finer stuff on top have already reduced and composted. Um, the bigger logs are still below. They're slowly composting. And you can, when you tear that up, you can see a bit of fungi and all that kind of thing going on. But essentially, you put about a year to two years hard work into it, and this would all just come back at you. It's a brilliant thing. One of the things that I love about permaculture is it involves humans doing good to the earth for a change. We're so used to hearing about how people are destroying the planet, and permaculture shows that our impact doesn't have to be destructive, but can instead be a force for healing the earth and helping other forms of life flourish. What I hope they take away from coming to, uh, to Limestone Permaculture for, you know, a tour, a visit, a workshop, um, you know, is inspiration. I want them to feel the way I feel. I suppose it's like all good things in life. When you experience something that's really, really good and puts a smile on your face every day, why wouldn't you want to share it? I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's changed my life, absolutely changed my life. It's changed my wife's life, my, my, my children's life. Um, it has, our, our health is by far better. I, I put it all down to permaculture. Um, a lot of people have a lot of reasons, um, but permaculture has absolutely changed my family's life.